Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Oh. In today's podcast, we're going to cover seven things you want to have in your code. Hey, everyone, it's Joe Glines here out of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie Stook here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And, and today we we're going to talk about seven things you want to have in your code. Now, these seven things, you don't always want to have each one of them, but generally speaking, you want to really consider whether you do want to have them in there or not, right? There are some things that sometimes you wouldn't want them in there. Um, let's just jump into it, right? So the very first one that for me comes to mind is thinking about um, your license or copywriting, right? To kind of state either it's open source, or even if it's not, it's just good to state it very clearly so people understand how they can use it. Yeah, because in, in a community, if, if you're actually sharing your code and not just building a piece of software where people wouldn't view the code, yeah, having a license or any kind of copywriting information there, because as soon as you share it, it in a way becomes public domain. So if you don't in some way emphasize a specific and um, I know it doesn't become public domain. It's still it's owned by the creator and stuff like that. But yeah, people might look at it differently if you have actually told them how you uh, want it to be handled. Yeah, and what I would even add to that is what you don't want to do is have to answer the same question over and over. Like, yes, you're free to use the code, right? Like make it clear at the beginning and it just saves everyone frustration. Yeah, I, I remember one where someone asked, what's the license on this piece of code? And someone says, uh, whatever the F you like, right? It's, um, and, and then the other guy came back and said, but what, how do I put that into, but if I say, do whatever you like with it, Am I actually putting a license on it? Uh, so it was a fun thought experiment that was happening there with some word twist and twisting and stuff like that. But yeah, we also have the second one, which is putting in a disclaimer. To me, that, that's also a great one where here we had the license and now you have a disclaimer. It can always be a good idea when you put out code um, because if you never know what people would try to do with it uh, or whatever they expect it to do. Let's say you had something that was meant to benchmark looping or whatever it might be. Uh, and someone ran it and expected it to not do a thing, but it actually heated the device or whatever it might be. Disclaimer, that's probably always a good idea. Well, or how about this? Let's just say um, you don't have a disclaimer in it, and yet someone is doing something else having nothing to do with your code, but they think your code broke, you know, the, what, whatever happened, right? It, it blew up the hard drive, right? Even though it had nothing to do with that. They still, it just, why, you know, why leave yourself open to that kind of a headache, right? Just having the disclaimer, just a smart thing to do. Like it's a no fault disclaimer, usually like use this code at your own risk, right? We take no responsibility because um, uh, people do crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now the next one I'd say is something that it, you know, this is where it kind of depends on like having a version number. Definitely. I would say like a, a date created or last modified. It's good to have in there, but the version number, a lot of the stuff I do, I don't have version numbers, right? I just, because they're not really a version of anything. They're it. Um, and it's not something, that, it's very, uh, oh, what's the right word? Uh, I'm trying to think, Temp temporal? No, uh, but they're, you know, they're not things that have, uh, uh, that are going to have a long shelf life, let's put it that way. It's a little snippet, um, but uh, yeah. Now, if you're developing something more complicated, that's when you having version numbers comes in very helpful. Yeah, at least if, if it's being, let's say it's being used, um, at a prolonged um, rate or might be a way. And I'm, I'm thinking about maybe Tilk's um, library for GDI plus. There were a specific numbering scheme going on there. And at one point it shifted over to supporting Unicode characters. 
And knowing that, and what version number you needed to be on to have that covered, helped a lot of other people helping people having issues. Oh, are you on that version? Okay, then this is your issue. Um, so, so yeah, version number or date created or last modified can be very useful when other people are using uh, bits and pieces of your code. That's for sure. One yeah, thing is what you get up of it. And the one I would throw on top of that, which um, it's, it's, it's related to it, is if you have requirements, like if there's a certain version for stuff we do, if you're, you know, the... Um, the code, like ours, will only run on this version of Auto Hotkey, you know, 1.4 plus or whatever, right? Make sure you include that because I'll tell you, or 32 bit, you know, and um, specifying those things can really help avoid a lot of confusion later. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say that the next one we have, the fourth one, is a way to contact you. And it could be an email, it could be an online handle, it can be almost anything. Um, if you're a company, then a web page or whatever. But yeah, a way to contact you, absolutely. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, that's, that's also where, which you and I have both learned. Sometimes I don't want, I, I even hesitate from publishing things because boy, when it, if it actually becomes popular, it be, can become a lot of work, right? Um, and sometimes I just tell people, look, I, I this is this is I did this work. This is it's cool. Change it however you want, right? That's the whole point of like you know I make it public and let people have the source code. Uh, but sometimes you want like the, some of the newer stuff we've done with our screen clipping tool and other things, we want to have a way for them to give us feedback so we can update it and alert us of, of issues and changes. So it it is a good good to include some way to get back in touch with you. Yeah, uh, and and then of course there's the next one is. You can build it into your script, but it's much more complex than you might think, but have ways where they can get updates to the links. At least, you know, what I like to do is, it, even though it's a little painful, you got to make the post and then go update it after. So make your post and then get the URL where you're actually having the main library, you know, housed at and include that in the code itself. And that makes it much easier when people download it to know where to go back and check and see if there's updates. Yeah, exactly. If if let's say you're storing it either on a main forum or main post or topic or whatever, or you have it on GitHub, whichever one it could be, make sure you have the URL in there, um, so so that people can actually refine it. Also, if you don't have any kind of official updating code in there, how else are people supposed to know which is and the up-to-date version? Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. Make sure you have that. Yeah, and also if you you know if you borrow not borrowed because that's it's still if you didn't borrow from other people have those resources in there as well. But um, citations, I should say. But if you were using like a Microsoft object, hey, have a link to the object. Make it easy for people to, if they want to learn more, they can jump to it, right? So additional resources that are relevant to what you did, that's a great thing to make available there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the great ones. Uh, the next one we have is uh, a unique identifier. This one moves kind of into um if you want to be able to identify the thing that you have made, let's say you put a pretty limited license on it and you want to know if your code is being used by other people for whatever reason, uh, there's few ways you can do it. And if you're working in some open source kind of um, situation where like the hotkey community where the level of people are expanding very widely. Oops. Some people are very new and some people have been around for many years. Using small tricks or whatever you would call that to identify the function you made, it might be something very popular and it would be hard for you to know if your license was being broken. Um, you could put in small uniquely identifiable things in your code. Let's say you were using variable names that um, correlated to, let's say your kid's birthday, so whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. it, you could easily have good things in there, 
that people wouldn't notify and necessarily notice. So, yeah, that actually, um, I at least first heard that when, and I don't know if you remember Jackie, I know you remember this, that's right. We did a, a webinar, I'd say like three years, two and a half years ago with my IP lawyer, uh, Stephen Thrasher. And that was one of the things when we were talking to him about an idea we were going to get patented. Um, he, he, that was one of the little tips he said was embed, have your developer embed certain things in your code of like your kid's birthdays hidden away in there somewhere. And that way, if someone ever uses it, you know, that, um, that you can later go, well, and they say that it's not your code. Well, they say, well, why are my kids' birthdays in it? <laughs> right. Like it's, if you have several of them, it's very hard for them to explain. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's one of the things you, you might not just want to print out the date of your kids' birthdays somewhere in easily identifiable, but you could probably do something um, that would be identifiable by you or right. something that you could point at at a later date. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is this kind of honeypot method. Uh, it's a way that basically you can catch people. You know, they they open the cookie jar and they, they reach inside and there was the honey there and they got it. They, you can track them, right? You can you can find them later. So you could put things uh, in, in a way, like let's say if you wanted to, you could embed something that would call your server and report their IP address or something, right? There's, there's things you could do that will get whoever's ever using it to link back to you. Um, and which, again, it just depends on what you're doing with your code and if you'd want to do that. Yeah, and, and I've seen different types of things. It might be where people are trying to get resources from your server, or it might be they want to use your software on licensed um, stuff like that, where when they try to get around different parts of it, you can put in methods to capture it. I've seen this used in many ways, and I'm not sure all of them are the honeypot method or whatever we're going to call it, but I've seen many ways for people to incriminate themselves when they try to either modify or remove um, licensing limits. So, so yeah, it, it can be a good way of putting in extra functions or functions that called incorrectly will lead them to exposing themselves or whichever wording you like. Um, I, I just thought of an extra bonus one and it's, it's bonus used as a double entendre kind of because, uh, hey, if you're interested, you know, throw in your PayPal donation button, you know, uh, link. If, if you, you know, if you, you want to try to get, uh, what I will say is like, hey, if my code has helped you and you're interested in making a small donation, you know, here's my PayPal, make it easy for him, right? Here's my PayPal link. Why not? Exactly. Patreon, whatever right. the type of thing that, that you like. Yeah. Yeah. Or just ask people to buy you a cup of coffee or right. something. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and if they're looking through your code, why not put it in there? Yeah. Do, FYI, don't say buy me a beer because for some people, they take that literally. Um, like, and I honestly, like, I, it's, I, I get, as I get older, I get so boring. Like, I, I don't even drink anymore. It's pathetic. But, um, but some guy was like, well, I would buy it, but I don't, I don't believe in alcohol. Blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that was just a figurative, you know, a way to kind of just you know, open a conversation up. It wasn't really to buy me a beer. Um, yeah. yeah, I could just as easily have put up the amount of a standard size beer somewhere. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I think it's a lot of good information there. Of what you want. And if, what are things that you guys would put in there that we didn't think of, right? What are things that you should have in there um, that we didn't mention? Love to hear. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to hear whatever you guys have found out that's useful to have in there. All right, see you next week. Yeah, bye. We love reading your comments, that's for sure. So let us hear what you think. We love those likes and please do share.